wishful thinking. It never happened. Uh, if if this hollow earth uh, it seems to be if it is if it's inhabited, uh, why aren't we uh, interacting with the inhabitants of the uh, of the hollow earth now, or have we? Uh, there there is record, as I said, in Dendera and also the Hopi Indians, that they have interacted with surface dwellers from time to time. Uh, there are lots of channelers out there. Uh, especially around the Mount Shasta area that say that they are interacting with inner earth people, but I haven't been able to validate that independently. And I, I'm a scientist. I don't believe. I don't disbelieve. I'm looking for evidence, and I'm trying to prove a hypothesis with, with reasonable experimentation. Well, that's it's, it's funny you say that because quite often um, we, as uh, I like to call... Uh, people in the truth movement, um, more so free thinkers. We're we're kind of like the the Aristotles or the um, Socrates of our time, where we take into account and accept everything that we see, and you know some things that we come up with. People look at us and they scratch our head. You know, holy moly, are you kidding me? That can't be true. But we you don't discount. You don't. Basically, you don't discount anything, you know, and that's that's the way it is. Some things that we do in our research, especially when we we look into, you know, what what is the what are the powers that be doing? What are they doing to? Uh, what are they preparing for? And then we kind of dig a little deeper, and we we see things, and the, the, hence the the whole conspiracy theory, and it just gets all blown out of proportion. But. Uh, it, but People should understand and appreciate, you know, where Dr. Agnew is going with this because as a scientist, just as we uh, feel compelled, say, 9-11 was an inside job. Okay, 9-11 was an inside job and there's science to fit that. Uh, but we're looked upon as, as, as uh, conspiracy theorists because of it. You know, it's, I think it's admirable that you're going after... Uh, this theory and and trying to confirm it. But I guess my question is how we see lava flows come up all the time. We see uh, heck, we're digging for oil right now. How can a uh, a culture or a, a race of or species live in a hollow earth if you've got all that stuff going on underneath? Well, it's it's relative, you know. The, We've only drilled uh, approximately eight miles into our crust. The crust is probably 1,000 to 1,100 miles thick. Mm -hmm. We haven't even scratched the surface. It's completely reasonable to say that there is magma flowing through uh, some kind of honeycomb or, or a plate on plate kind of formation in the crust. That's perfectly reasonable. Mm -hmm. When we have earthquakes, the crust rings like a bell for days. And we take sort of a CAT scan of the Earth every time we have a major earthquake. We have a pretty clear picture of what the interior of the Earth looks like. But currently, planetary core geologists uh, fit that data to the theory that we live on top of a molten ball of rock floating around on it like cornflakes in a bowl of milk. Mm -hmm. The data has to be manipulated to fit that model. If you take just the data without the model and work it backwards, like from the point where the uh, vibrations are picked up and work them backwards to the point of the earthquake, you get a very clear picture of how thick the crust is and the fact that we have a hollow center. But that doesn't fit the, the current paradigm of planetary core uh, geology, so they make it fit their idea. And I'm sorry to say that most of the organized sciences uh, succumb to that same kind of data fitting. Uh, we, on this expedition, realize that we're going to probably come across data that doesn't fit any current paradigm. So we're going to be prepared to record it and analyze it with an open mind. For instance, we're, one, our film uh, leader, uh, team leader is Jose Escamilla. Jose Escamilla discovered a new life form because he photographs invisible and infrared light at the same time. 
two identical cameras side by side. And, and he produced a recent film, which is called uh, UFOs, The Greatest Story Ever Denied. And uh, we find that his filming techniques and his open-mindedness to looking into alternative wavelengths of light for his information makes him a key player at being able to discover if something does fly by our ship out there in the middle of nowhere. That's, I'll tell you what, that's, uh, it's refreshing to hear. The, um, you had a lot of experience. I remember watching a, uh, a show that exposed, or a movie that exposed Harp, and you were uh, a key uh, speaker in, in that movie. And one of the things that you talked about was doing, um, uh, measuring uh, the depth using RF. You know, you, you take RF, you bounce it up, you, you, it bounces back down, and it vibrates the stuff underneath the surface. Is it, it, can you map the interior of the planet using that type of method? Is that how they've come across, or um, is that how the data is, is um, promulgated, I guess you could say? It could be. Now, I was using uh, fairly long radi wave radiation at low volumes, uh, low amplitude, 100 watts or less. And I was only going down to about 3,000 feet with meaningful data, meaningful repeatable data. Mm -hmm. uh, you would need very long wave radiation, like in the ELF or even ULF ranges, to be able to go deeper into the planet. And the only instrument on Earth that's got that kind of power is HARP. And uh, I don't know which one of the specials you watched, whether it was the True TV one, the History Channel one, or the Holes in Heaven one. I think I've seen them but all. <laughs> in, in the first two, I actually built a scale model of HARP and, and demonstrated how it can move clouds, right. how it can manipulate weather. It's, it's, it's pretty easy to do. And, and, and once you watch it on film, you go, OK, now I understand how you can move the jet stream and how you can move clouds around using ARP. Of course you can. It's, it's the easiest thing in the world to do. And I could demonstrate it again in, in an hour just by setting up the experiment again and running it again. It's very repeatable. Um, so I can basically make my own little harp station out in my backyard and cause the rain to fall on my garden when I want it to? Well, it wouldn't be little. It would be pretty big. You'd have to have uh, probably half a billion watts to be able to do it uh, on that kind of scale. The danger of HARP, and the reason I got involved in that project, I was, I was all through with my research by the time HARP became a real issue. In 1997, I was asked to participate in the Holes in Heaven documentary. I became alarmed because of the frequencies that they were using and the power ranges that they were using and the fact that there were no safeguards whatsoever for chain reactions. Uh, there are two things that would be just planetarily devastating if they occurred. One is a phenomenon, uh, Dr. Bernard Eastland, who's the guy that invented ARP, he's since passed away, uh, which is called the ionospheric breakdown. Now his, his paper was pretty good. I took it and went to the next level, corroborated with him, took it to the next level, and, and what I, the conclusion that I came up with is that ARP could be used to form an ion path between ground and the ionosphere. And if that happens, you get a lightning bolt that it's a, that's about a kilometer in diameter. And every time it strikes the Earth, it's like 50 Mount St. Helens going off at once. And it would that's do that for about a minute and a half every second, which would be really, really devastating to the planet. Plus, it would wipe out the ozone layer for between 20 and 40 years. It depends on, on how soon it would rebuild itself. But you wouldn't be able to go outside without a long sleeve shirt on and a hat uh, for, for half, a, half, a, um, a, um, half a century. Did you, um, now, now HARP is a, a product of Nikola Tesla's research, is it not? Uh, Nikola Tesla was the guy that came up with the idea Bernard Eastland is the guy that patented it and built it for the, for the U.S. Navy. It is now operated by the Navy uh, in Alaska, and it is a highly top-secret site. The reason the Navy operates it is one of its functions is to transmit coded ELF messages to nuclear submarines. Right, right, right. 
and and 